Hello, and welcome to this edition of Safe and Sound. I'm your host, Doug Bolnick, from St. Charles County's Department of Community Health and the Environment. On today's show, we're going to be discussing some scary subjects and seeking answers that will help ease our fears. For some, the simple act of eating or even being in the room with the aromas from some foods can be frightening. To help us understand the impact that food allergies can have on the lives of our friends, neighbors, and loved ones, we will talk with Joy Krieger from the St. Louis chapter of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation. Raising a child is another potentially scary subject. St. Charles County Health Educator Brittany Camacho will explain how her Parenting 101 classes can provide helpful tips on raising young children. Many of us are afraid to look at our ever-rising utility bills each month, which is why Mary Jane Clark from Quiver River Electric Cooperative will offer some simple suggestions on ways that homeowners and businesses can conserve energy usage and lower their bills. First responders and cell phone companies have developed the ICE contact program to improve communications to loved ones in case of emergencies. Today, we will show you how to take advantage of this helpful tip. We will end the show with a frank discussion with Marianne Adolf from St. Charles County's STD Clinic about efforts to prevent and treat sexually transmitted diseases in our county. But first, as we prepare for the season of Ghosts and Goblins, Kyle Gaines from the St. Charles County Ambulance District will provide tips that will make sure your Halloween celebration is safe and sound. St. Charles County Ambulance District has offered a Halloween safety program for many, many years. But actually, it was about four years ago that we were able to kick this program into high gear, thanks to some very generous support from our friends at State Farm Insurance Company. For each of the last four years, State Farm has given us a Safe Neighbors grant in the amount of $5,000 that allows us to purchase Halloween safety materials for area children. About two years ago, we also added another component into the program, which was bringing on board the St. Charles City County Library District. Uh, with bringing them on board, we now offer Halloween safety presentations at seven of their area library branches, uh, which are located all over the county. In those presentations, we go through Halloween safety with the kids, we give them a tour of the ambulance, and then the children's librarians read a Halloween story and do a little Halloween craft with the kids. Costume selection is very important in terms of overall safety on Halloween night for kids. One of the biggest things parents can do to make sure that the costume is safe is ensure that it's of the appropriate size for their child. One of the biggest problems we see as far as injuries uh, related to Halloween night is just simply kids tripping and falling because a, a princess dress was too long or a cape was too long or you know something of that nature where fabric is dragging the ground either in front of, to the side of them, behind them, or something like that. If the costume involves props, uh, things like wands on princess or um, costumes like that, knives or other weaponry on ninja costumes or other costumes like that, those props need to be made of a flexible material. Some of the props that are out there, even at costume supply shops, are made of a fairly rigid plastic material that could really hurt kids if they were to trip and fall on those items. One other thing to keep in mind, masks. A lot of costumes involve masks. Typically, your, your Michael Myers, your Jason, your Freddy Krueger, all those types of costumes do involve masks. Uh, the eye holes are something to very much keep, uh, keep in mind whenever looking at those types of costumes. If you put the mask on, you can see that you're only able to see right out in front of you the peripheral vision is a problem. And obviously, if you're talking about crossing the street, things like that, that peripheral vision is vitally important. The, typically, those masks can be retrofitted a little bit just by widening those eye holes a little bit with, uh, with a pair of scissors if needed. Um, if the kids are concerned about the, the look of the costume, you can always use some face paint to kind of blend around the eyes so that uh, the, the overall look of the costume isn't compromised uh, in the kiddo's mind. Participation in the Halloween safety program is very easy. There's a number of ways to participate. If you'd like to take your kids or your grandkids to join us for one of the presentations at one of the library branches, all that the library asks is that you register to do that on their website, and their website is youranswerplace.org and you just go to the children's programming schedule and you'll be able to see the dates for the Halloween safety programs um, listed in that calendar. They just ask that you re register with your library card and register the number of children that will be attending. Um, as far as others in the community who may want to share the messaging of the Halloween safety tips that we, we have available, uh, teachers, Sunday school teachers, uh, scout leaders, anyone like that, is more than welcome to call us and request materials for their group. We have reflective candy bags available. We have glow bracelets available. 
All those types of things we are more than happy to provide while supplies last to uh, those in the community that have contact with kids. Uh, give us a call at 636-344-7600 and we'd be more than happy to arrange for pickup of those items. Uh, like I said, we do have limited quantities, so calling us earlier in the month of October rather than later would probably be advised. But again, we are more than happy to provide those items to uh, those in the community who, who would like them for their group. And certainly individuals, it, even if you're not a you know, scout leader or teacher or anything like that. If you just like you know, a handful of bracelets for your kids, by all means, give us a call. Swing in and pick up a few. We'd be more than happy to provide them to you. Thanks for the information, Kyle. This will be a great help for us all as we plan for Halloween. Another thing to consider when planning for birthdays, holiday parties, and trick-or-treating giveaways is that many in our community are allergic to some foods and food products. To help explain what to look for and to offer suggestions on ways to prevent adverse reactions, we've invited Joy Krieger, Executive Director from the St. Louis Chapter of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation to join us. Joy, thanks for coming in today. Thanks for having me. For many with food allergies, something as simple as having dinner or being in the same room as someone that's eating can cause very, very big problems. What exactly is a food allergy? Well, actually there are two types of food allergies. One is considered a food intolerance, meaning when you eat something and your tummy just doesn't feel right, or you have a little nausea, or perhaps some diarrhea, that's considered a food intolerance. But a food allergy is when you eat a harmless piece of food that your body then thinks of it as an enemy and it wants to attack back. And it affects the immune system and can be life-threatening. What are some common symptoms for people that do have the food allergies, and what are some types of foods that cause them? Well, some of the common symptoms now strictly of a food allergy where it's life-threatening, initially the, your inside of your mouth will start to swell. Your tongue will swell, your lips will swell, then it gradually goes down and your throat will start swelling. You can become eventually confused, um, have a difficult time breathing because the swelling is not allowing the air to go and all of these things can happen rather quickly if you have an allergy to a food item. And then some of the most common allergy uh, food items that you're allergic to, peanuts are the most severe and truly cause the most life-threatening. There are tree nuts, shellfish, eggs, soy, milk. There's eight leading ones that most people um, are allergic to and a lot of kids uh, babies can get them as early as nine months and they do some of those items they can grow out of but mostly the peanut you do not grow out of that. So you mentioned that this goes even as, as young as, as infants. Do we know how many people in the United States or even in the world have food allergies? Well they're saying right now one in 13 people will have a food allergy that can be life-threatening. We talked about some of the symptoms, some things to look for. What are some of the treatments if someone did have a food allergy? Most of the people that have it would know it, but some of their caregivers, some of their teachers, some of their neighbors may not. What are some of the things that we can do to help treat someone that does become affected? Well, clearly, I think if it's an early age child and they've started to show signs of a food allergy, I'm sure that the parent has taken the child to the physician and they've given what's called an EpiPen. It looks like a pen. It's you carry it on your person. The school nurses know about it. It's, it's in fact a law in the state of Missouri now uh, due to House Bill 922, which was in 2010, that all schools have a food allergy management program and schools can stock these EpiPens in the event that a child maybe doesn't know, they don't know the child has an allergy or for some reason the pen is, is not in the school setting. So the nurse can give it too. But the child should have that EpiPen with them at all times so that you just stab it on a leg or an arm or a stomach and you don't put it in the vein, but you do stab it and it's, you don't even see a needle the way they make them so fancy now. But you should always have the EpiPen. And then you give it and then it always has two with it. So within five minutes you get the second dose. Now, one of the things is people think, well, I'll just take a Benadryl. I know I'm going to be around something and our physicians, and I can't tell you that that will not save a life. Benadryl, it has to go through the oral part of, I mean, it goes through the, the GI system. It has to go in the stomach and all before it gets into the body. You do not have that kind of time. Do not rely on Benadryl. Obviously, 
taking care of something before it happens is the best way to treat that because it is a, such a scary situation. What are some things that we should consider, especially with the holidays coming up and Halloween in particular, as neighbors, as community members, what are some things that we can do to, to help avoid these situations? When my kids were growing up, we knew there was a child in our neighborhood who had a peanut allergy, so everyone combined together wouldn't provide any kind of snack um, for them to trick or treat with that had that in there. So you could keep that in mind if you truly know someone. Or just stay away from food like that altogether and put a toy of some sort in there. What I would like to tell you is even if you think you're doing the right thing by reading a label and looking at a candy and there you see nothing written on there that says peanuts, believe it or not, if it doesn't say actually no peanuts, that candy could be made on the same machine of another candy that has peanuts. We have found that out with other clients that call and tell us that. So that's not being safe enough. I would kind of stay clear of candy altogether. The other thing I'd like to keep, want people to know is that the gel that you buy for the hand sanitizer that you see a lot of people carrying in their purses, their backpacks, that does not break down the protein in the peanut. So you will not cleanse your hands from anything if you've been touching peanuts. So the best thing to use are those wipes, the antiseptic wipes. They do break down the protein. And as the executive director for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation, you guys do a lot more than just food allergies. Would you talk about what some of the programs that you offer for the community on a regular basis? Well, we serve those with asthma and allergies of all types throughout our community. Families who have an income within 200% of the federal guidelines for poverty, we provide them free medication and equipment to take care of their asthma and some of their allergy symptoms as well. So we do that. We have a huge program with school nurses. We were fortunate to pass a law in 2012, House Bill 1188, for all school nurses to stock albuterol, which is the rescue medication for any child who may suffer an acute asthma episode at school. So we <clears throat> work closely with the school nurses. We supply them with the equipment they need to do a breathing machine, with a breathing machine, and then we provide them with free albuterol, which is the solution that goes in the machine. So we do that. We do a lot of advocacy work. We're work currently working right now in changing the way asthma care is delivered in Missouri. We want um, Medicaid to provide asthma education and home assessments. We realize that kids, we spend, as adults or kids, you spend more than a third of your life in your home. And a lot of times you don't even realize that what's going on in your home could be toxic. It could be toxic to the child. And sometimes parents don't realize that the dog sleeping in the bed or the dust mites that tend to be in old mattresses and old pillows, things like that. So we want home assessments. It's studies have proven that we, you can make improvements and, and impact people's lives and in, enrich their lives uh, healthier by doing so. So if you were, or were a parent or if you are a medical provider, how could somebody get more information about your organization? You can call our office. It's 314-645-2422 or our website, www.aafastl.org. But someone is there. We provide resources a lot, too, for people just having questions. Thanks a lot, Joy, for coming in today. This is definitely a lot of information that our viewers should pay attention to for the holidays. Thank you for asking me. When we return from a short break, we'll offer more helpful tips for keeping you and your family safe and sound. Over 13 million people are affected by famine, war, and drought in the Horn of Africa. Make a simple text donation of $10. But do more than donate. Forward the facts. Welcome back to Safe and Sound. I'm your host, Doug Bolnick. Knowing what to do and how to raise a child can be scary. To alleviate some of those fears and provide helpful tips, St. Charles County Health Educator Brittany Camacho teaches Parenting 101 classes. Our Parenting 101 program is an introductory parenting class in which we cover a lot of different topics. Everything from bonding with your child uh, through communication and how communication develops throughout infancy and childhood. Also we talk about child safety tips, safe sleep, car seat safety, uh, home safety. We talk about child discipline and we also cover what are some local resources that parents might be able to call upon in their parenting journey. 
These classes are open uh, to anyone who would like to attend. Uh, first time parents uh, would certainly benefit from the information that we are offering, but also other caregivers such as grandparents and aunts and uncles who might have a significant role in uh, child care for that child, they can always use a refresher as well. Along with the valuable information, they will also get a free convertible car seat, which can be used for infants five up to 40 pounds in both the rear facing and forward facing position. We feel like this is um, a huge asset to parents because car crashes are the leading cause of death among children and 73% of all car seats are not used properly. We do give parents a lot of information on how to properly install and place their child in an infant car seat. To receive the free car seat as a part of their participation, a person must be a St. Charles County resident, but anyone is welcome to attend the class. We offer the Parenting 101 course here at the St. Charles County Department of Community Health and the Environment in our large conference room. We typically get a lot of participants through our Women's, Infants, and Children's Nutrition Program. We offer about two classes each month, and if somebody would be interested in registering, they would call me at 636-949-7400, extension 6255. Thanks, Brittany, for offering these programs that give parents a helping hand. To give homeowners a helping hand on lowering their electric bills, Quiver River Electric Cooperative offers suggestions. Mary Jane Clark, who is the communications manager for the cooperative, joins us to explain how these tips can also help conserve resources as well. Thanks a lot for joining us, Mary Jane. Thank you. What exactly does the Quiver River Electric Cooperative do and who do you serve? Well, we do provide uh, electricity to about 60,000 homes and businesses in St. Charles, Lincoln, Warren, and Pike counties. Why is it important to be aware of the use of energy? Um, does it help to lower our electric bills? Does it help to conserve future resources? What, why would we even care? Well, most families really care about their pocketbook. So saving energy equals saving money, and that is the top priority of most homeowners. Uh, we recently conducted a survey right here in Missouri of all the uh, electric cooperatives, and that was a number one priority. That being said, most people also want to conserve resources, and uh, the good news is that you don't really have to choose between the two. Um, you can use energy more wisely and save resources and reduce your energy cost. Um, cons conservation was the buzzword of my generation and when you conserve, you use less, you pay less, you get less. Energy efficiency more accurately reflects how we discuss energy today. Uh, energy efficiency is more than just conservation it means that you can probably use less and get more for it. And so, you know, the bottom line is you can accomplish both. Like you said, money is one of the driving factors for this. When is a good time to evaluate your usage by looking at your electric bill? Well, uh, now is really a very good time. Um, when the temperatures are moderate like they are in the fall or in the spring, um, you're not using your heating and cooling system as much. Heating and cooling accounts for about 55% of all the energy we use in our homes. So if you're trying to find small ways to save, uh, looking for that when your furnace or air conditioning is running all the time is kind of like looking for a needle in a haystack. So when the temperatures are moderate, uh, first of all, it's a good time to do maintenance on your heating and cooling system to make sure it's reliable and efficient when you do need it. Um, but it's also a good time to look at that 45% of all the other things that use energy in your home and um, they're a lot easier to find. So that's probably going to be, you know, appliances, home electronics, uh, refrigeration, lighting, things like that. And what are some of the small things that people can do to, to, to lower their costs and actually to help out and use less energy? Well, one of the things we recommend is doing um, a home energy audit. You can do your own audit. We have a checklist that's available, but there are a lot of di good diagnostic tools out there available either through us or on the internet and just start taking an inventory of your home. See what's plugged into the wall, you know, where are the switches that you flip every day, um, and maybe use energy 24 hours a day and you don't even know it. So check those electronics. Um, a phantom load is, is an increasing um, con way that people use energy. We often talk about phantom load, and that's all the mysterious ways or invisible ways that you use energy in your home every day. Um, like with uh, your TV, DVD, DVR, 
uh, phone chargers, all the things that you plug into your wall that use electricity every day. So if you can kind of take a look at that phantom load, maybe put it on a, a special power strip that turns it off, you can, you can save quite a bit. But there are a lot of low cost or no cost ways to begin saving energy and in the fall and spring it starts with a caulking gun. So look for ways that your home might be leaking air which is the, you know, the air that you condition to be comfortable um, and ca caulk those windows and seal cracks and things like that. It's very, very affordable and can really save you quite a bit. Uh, you also maybe want to check your water heater temperature and make sure that it's no higher than 120 degrees. That's generally what we recommend. Um, if you're considering any home repairs, check that insulation. Um, getting your insulation up to about R45 in the attic can start to save you hundreds of dollars a year. So that's another good place to look for savings. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of little ways that can really add up to big savings. Those are some really interesting ideas. Where else can people go to find resources to help them lower their energy costs and conserve energy? Well, we have a lot of free booklets available that uh, we'll provide to anyone who calls our office at 800-392-3709. There are also a lot of great website resources. Our own website, quiver.com, the Missouri Division of Energy has uh, great resources on its website, energystar.gov. You know, all have great information for consumers to use. Thanks a lot, Mary Jane, for coming in today. It's always great when we can find helpful tips that aid our community and also save us money at the same time. We'll be right back with more helpful hints after this message. Have you heard of Rett Syndrome? I hadn't until my niece Courtney was diagnosed. The International Rett Syndrome Foundation hopes to find the families affected by this devastating disorder. Please call 1-800-818-7388 or visit rettsyndrome.org today. Welcome back. We thank you for tuning in to today's episode of Safe and Sound, where we are focusing on information that can help our families in scary situations. Many of us use our cell phones to communicate with others on a daily basis, but many do not know that first responders like EMTs, firemen, and police officers can use our phones to contact loved ones in times of emergency, even when we are unconscious. Let's hear from St. Charles County Ambulance District Public Information Officer Marty Limpert, who will introduce us to the ICE program. ICE is kind of a national initiative to help first responders, and people can enter to their cell phone, they can enter the, the, uh, the contact ICE, I-C-E, which stands for in case of emergency. And that when, when first responders get to the scene, if they can't locate somebody, they need to get them right away, they can go scroll through their phone contact list, find that, and call that person to get some information they might need. Besides first responders, like police, fire, and, and paramedics, EMS workers, emergency room hospital staff can use that as well. Um, oftentimes, um, personal properties brought in with somebody who might be unconscious, uh, their phone may be in their purse or in their pocket, and they can scroll through to find some valuable information. The basic application of just putting in as a contact is pretty generic. You can just put in ICE, the person's name you want to be contacted, whether it's your, your daughter, your son, whoever, somebody who has power of attorney, especially for older adults who somebody might have to make some of their medical decisions depending on how, how serious the issue is, and which is the phone number to call. Besides the, the basic contact information that you can just go in and change your contact to ICE and your daughter or son, whatever that first name is in their phone number, you can also go into your applications on your phone and there's, um, there, there's different parts in there that you can download. It might be a photo, it might be something about your medical history, but you can make it a little bit more extensive. Really as first responders, really all we really need is somebody to call right away. If somebody has an allergy or something like that, hopefully they have a medical alert bracelet that they're wearing, but um, usually in an emergency seconds are very valuable so we just try to call somebody right away on the way to the hospital. The, the ambulance district last year we had an initiative for, for the ICE, ICE program. We went to um, all the senior living residences out here and we did over a thousand people we, in, we put ICE contacts into their phone. We did it under the auspices of having an ice cream social so we invited them all in, we gave, made Sundays for them and then we set their phones up for them because some just don't know, understand technology to put the information in there. So it was a huge success last year to do that. You can go to St. Charles County Ambulance District website um, and, and look at our website. We have information on the ICE program, but you can just type in on any internet search, ICE, in case of emergency, and they'll give you all the information on it. But it's a national program, which is really great. So if you're in St. Charles and you're visiting Florida, it's all over the country, so it's great. It's, in fact, it's even international. We appreciate you sharing this information, Marty. Half of all new sexually transmitted disease cases in the United States 
occur among those between the ages of 15 and 24. We have asked Mary Ann Adolph, Supervisor for St. Charles County's STD Clinic, to describe efforts in our community to prevent these diseases. Mary Ann, thanks for coming in today. Thank you very much for having me, Doug. I appreciate coming. The St. Charles County STD Clinic offers a number of services. Can you talk about what those services are and where you can get them? Sure. Well, first of all, we're located at 1650 Boonslick Road, and we have appointment visits for STD testing. And in the clinic, we can test you for gonorrhea, chlamydia, HIV, and syphilis. And in addition to doing the testing program, we also have a very active education program. And so I go out into the community and I will visit groups of generally teenagers, but we are available for any group. And we talk about STD prevention and the prevalence, not only just in our county, but also nationwide. And you mentioned a few of the diseases that you treat. Are those the most common sexually transmitted diseases and what are some of the symptoms that people may have if they... Those are the four most common. There are quite a number of others. Generally speaking, what we see in our clinic and what we see in the county and in the state of Missouri are things like gonorrhea and chlamydia, which are bacterial STDs. So we treat and cure those. Often both men and women never have any signs or symptoms of those infections. So it's very important that anyone who is sexually active in particular those people who have more than one sexual partner in a year, that they have an annual screening for those two bacterial STDs. And then we also see another bacterial STD, and that one is syphilis. Low numbers for that, but from time to time we see spikes in this area and also nationwide. And then we also screen for HIV. Now the prevalence of that in St. Charles County is low, but we do recommend that anyone who is practicing unsafe sex practices or who has multiple pa partners have that screening done as well. And you talked a little bit about what your staff does out in the community to help prevent uh, STD transmissions and, and just general talk about prevention things. What are some other things that you do and what are some things that individuals themselves can do to prevent the spread of STDs? Well, the first step to avoiding STD is to educate yourself about them. You can get information from our clinic. We provide brochures to anyone who walks into the clinic. Then we also recommend the Centers for Disease Control website, and that's www.cdc.gov. It's a government website. They are the authorities on STD, and they help to guide our practices. And then people also need to be aware of their own bodies to understand what happens when you get an STD, what signs and symptoms might be occurring, and then know how to access, access services such as those in our clinic. If someone is concerned that they may be exposed to or even infected by an STD, what are some things that you as the STD clinic can offer as treatment and what should they expect for that first appointment? You did mention that it's an appointment basis, but what should they expect for that first visit? It is an appointment basis. Uh, generally speaking, we have clinic hours on Monday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Um, we do some other visits on Tuesdays and Fridays. Once you come into the clinic, you will have the obligatory paperwork that you would in any kind of a facility. Uh, we'll gather some demographic information about you. Although our services are confidential, they are not anonymous, we do need to have a means for being able to contact you if, if your test results come back positive. Then after that, you will meet with the nurse who will continue to gather some additional information about your past physical his history and health history and any uh, sexual practices that you may be engaging in. From there, she will do a blood draw, and that will test for syphilis and HIV. Um, I must say that the nurse that we have in our clinic is one of the best nurses that I've ever worked with, and she's always complimented on how gentle she is with her blood draw. People, for some reason, are always afraid of needles, um, and we understand that. So uh, the area that we utilize for the services are very comfortable. Um, aesthetically pleasing. I think that everyone who comes into the office will feel very comfortable not only with our nurses and our staff but also with the physical surroundings. Once that blood draw has taken place then um, I step in to do the examination for men and women both. We see people from ages 13 on up. Um, there's no limitation on the upper end of the age as to when people may become exposed to STD. Uh, for men, we provide a culture for both gonorrhea and chlamydia. For women, gonorrhea and chlamydia as well, along with a pelvic examination. 
And also during that time, I'm doing a generalized physical assessment of other things that might be going on in terms of anything like genital herpes or genital warts, any other lesions that might indicate the presence of STD. And one more time, uh, if someone was interested in getting some services with you, what number should they call? Real easy to get in touch with us, 636-949-7401. You will have a menu to choose from, first one being uh, directions and hours of the clinic, press two to talk to the secretary and to make an appointment. Thanks a lot, Mary Ann, for this information. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I hope we helped you become a little more at ease when it comes to scary subjects. Please join me next time when we'll discover more ways to keep you and your family safe and sound.